Hi, everyone. Welcome to the talk. Um, for those of you who are watching, my name is uh, Sharon Lee from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, it's my great pleasure to be back and to give another talk at the Future of Data-Centric AI special event. Um, I would like to thank the organizers in particular for inviting me um, and also for putting together um, an exciting agenda. So today I will be sharing with you some uh, interesting challenges and opportunities around detecting data distributional shift. And hopefully this talk will inspire you to uh, think about or even pursue some of the problems um, in the future as well. So I would like to start the talk by uh, showing you this video. Uh, this is a model trained on the Berkeley Deep Drive 100K dataset performing bounding box tracking on the road. And whenever we see videos like this, uh, we may get this overly positive impression of how remarkable deep learning models are, um, which are true in some cases. Um, in my research, I encourage um, researchers and practitioners to also look at the other side as well. Um, especially be aware of unexpected situations that the model wasn't trained for. And to see what I mean, um, let's maybe think about for how you would uh, maybe build and deploy such a self-driving car model, right? So the typical process is to collect some training data with corresponding labels and then train on your favorite machine learning model. Um, here, the output typically contains some predefined categories, such as uh, pedestrians and cars and truck and so on in this case. And so when the model uh, finally gets deployed in the wild, which is often a highly dynamic and uncertain environment, so the model will inevitably encounter some new contexts and data that was not taught to this uh, learning algorithm in training time. And this is called the open word setting in contrast to the uh, classic closed word machine learning. For example, um, in our recent paper, uh, we took this image from the MS Coco data set and run through the um, self-driving car model that was just trained on BDD. And so here you can see the model can produce um, overconfident predictions for this um, unknown object, um, the helicopter. Uh, which was never exposed to the to this model during the training time. And so you see that it's actually being predicted into um, a truck, um, which is one of the in distribution categories. So in other words, uh, deep networks do not necessarily know uh, what they don't know. And this has um, raised significant concerns on models reliability and safety. And believe it or not, um, this kind of uh, event can happen in real life as well, um, causing huge consequences. Um, for example, I'm quoting a news article uh, from just about three months ago, um, where a Tesla vehicle was um, reported to crash into a private jet that's worth $3.5 million. And so, this out of distribution detection problem has uh, become uh, very, very important. Um, and a fun story that I want to share. Um, I remember back in 2016 and 17 ish uh, when we started working on this problem and submitted our uh, one of our first papers on OOD detection called ODIN to the conference. And we were really troubled by, you know, people questioning. Um, why should we care and why bother solving this problem? And fast forward um, six years. Uh, nowadays, if you um, write a paper about out of distribution, um, the almost the first thing that reviewer would say is um, this paper tackles a very important problem in machine learning. Um, so it's really great to see this increasing uh, awareness from the research community and industry um, as well over time. So now let's look at this problem formulation uh, more formally, just to set up the stage. Um, so here, let's say we have our 
uh, training data distribution um, that is a mixture of um, two uh, Gaussians for class label y equals to one and minus one. And so our in distribution pn uh, would be the marginal of this joint distribution over the input space. And during test time, these orange dots could emerge, um, which are out of distribution from an uh, unknown class that doesn't belong to either uh, y equals to one or minus one, and therefore should not be predicted into these two labels. And to translate this toy data into um, high dimensional images, for example, um, you can think of Cypher 10 on the left-hand side being the in distribution and um, Street View housing number SVHN on the right-hand side being the OOD, which has disjoint labels. And so SVHN is, um, of course, just one of the OOD um, data set that a model may encounter. And there are many other unknowns on this um, complex data manifold. Um, for example, um, as shown on the right-hand side, um, imagine that's the manifold of all the possible images one could uh, possibly generate and encounter on the internet. Um, it's a lot more complex, right, compared to this task-specific data set on the left-hand side. Um, so I think this um, image, which credits to OpenAI, uh, really nicely illustrates these, um, the complexity of the problem. And so out of distribution detection is a hard problem. And before we get into the methodology, um, I just wanted to spend a couple of slides explaining um, the why. So the first challenge is the lack of unknowns um, during training time. The model is typically um, trained only on the in-distribution data, in this case, the green and blue dots using empirical risk minimization. And it can be difficult to anticipate where these um, orange dots could emerge in advance because there can be a huge space of unknowns, um, especially if you extrapolate this to be um, the high dimensional space. And the problem is um, further um, exacerbated by the high capacity neural networks um, that we're working with nowadays and are just keep getting uh, bigger and uh, more complex, right? And so to explain what I mean by that, um, here I'm showing you uh, one of my favorite figures. Um, this is um, an in-distribution uh, classification with three classes. Um, so we have a mixture of uh, three Gaussians highlighted in gray. And the model is trained using um, the standard cross entropy loss to classify these um, three classes. And so you see that the model learns this triangular, uh, triangular shape decision boundary, which does you know, a perfect job um, in terms of you know, separating uh, among these three classes. However, uh, the trouble arises uh, when it comes to OOD detection, um, because you see that the decision boundary is um, quite ill-fated, right? Those red region um, corresponds to high confidence uh, regions, um, despite being very far away from our in-distribution data. And so therefore, this is a model, this is the case where a model is, uh, you know, is, is perfectly fine for classification, but it cannot reliably tell apart um, ID versus OOD. And just in case you're wondering, um, can we perform uh, density estimation to directly estimate the likelihood? Um, it turns out um, there are some challenges too. For example, training deep generative models can be um, hard to optimize. And moreover, um, generative models doesn't provide classification uh, ability either, which is something we're interested in. And one last challenge is that uh, real world images um, are composed of uh, multiple objects and components. And therefore, we need uh, a finer grained understanding of um, OOD at the object level uh, beyond uh, image level. 
So um, here in this slide, I, um, I outline um, a few research directions um, that we have been pursuing, but there's also plenty of uh, open problems out there. And um, I roughly divide this, th this into um, three parts. Um, so I'll first talk about how to measure um, out of distribution um, uncertainty. Um, and then I will talk about um, learning objective design that can facilitate um, OOD detection. And lastly, I'll talk about connection to the um, to the real world. So let's start with um, the scoring function. So the earliest work um, adopted this post hoc approach uh, for OOD detection. Um, here, a model is typically trained on the in-distribution data, say Cypher 10, uh, using empirical risk minimization. And once it's trained, let's take the network as it is without modifying its parameters. And so during inference time, for any given input, we're going to devise a scoring function. Um, let's call this S um, for detection. Um, essentially, we're performing a level set estimation. Um, if the score is below certain threshold, we're going to reject this input. And otherwise, uh, we'll produce the class prediction as usual. And so the advantage of post hoc OOD detection is that um, it doesn't interfere with our uh, original task. Um, and therefore, the model can guarantee to have the same performance in classification um, while having this additional safety layer um, almost for free. And I also want to note that um, the problem is um, different from the uh, anomaly detection problem, which is um, also a classic machine learning uh, problem that treats all the data as um, one class without necessarily differentiating uh, the class labels. And so here, uh, OOD detection often cares about achieving two goals simultaneously. Uh, we want to be able to uh, classify or for multi-class classification, and on top of that, uh, distinguish ID versus OOD. And so a common baseline is to use the um, softmax confidence score, um, which is also the largest uh, posterior probability um, from the model. Um, however, it doesn't really work well because neural networks tend to produce this overconfident predictions as we saw earlier, right? So as highlighted in this red circle, for both um, ID and OOD, there is a non-trivial fraction of data that can produce this maximum um, softmax probability, um, close to one. And so you can't reliably draw a threshold somewhere and separate these two types of data. And so in our NeurIPS um, 20 paper, uh, we put forward an energy-based OOD detection framework, um, which has the uh, core idea that influenced uh, many of our um, recent works um, and other researchers as well. And so I see this as an important uh, milestone because it really brings a new perspective to the, to the community. And compared to the confidence score, we show that energy score can better uh, perform OOD detection, both uh, in theory and empirically as well. And so here is the high level view. Uh, let's say we have our input, um, which goes through the network um, parameterized by theta. And then energy, and then we calculate this energy score, which I'll talk about the definition um, in the next slide coming up. And once we have the energy score, uh, we perform this um, thresholding comparison. Um, if um, it's uh, smaller than this uh, threshold tau, uh, tau we're going to reject this input. Um, and here we flip the sign. Uh, this x-axis is based on the uh, negative energy, um, just to align with the convention that uh, larger score indicates um, uh, in distribution and vice versa. Okay, so how do we calculate energy score? Um, to explain this, um, I would like to first remind you, uh, this is the standard definition of um, softmax function, where the probability for an input to 
be associated with label Y. So P of Y condition on X um, is given uh, in this form, right? Um, and the, the middle part of the equation is to uh, rewrite this in terms of the joint uh, probability divided by the likelihood of P of X. And so now we can uh, connect um, the definition um, to this um, equation here. Um, energy score is really the, the, the negative of the log um, of the denominator in the softmax function. And so as you can see here, energy has this inherent connection to this um, log likelihood. Um, and later on, you know, we'll, we'll come back to this, uh, this, this connection, uh, but I just wanted to signpost to this, um, this here. And so with energy score, the distribution um, become much more separable. Um, as you can see here, um, the, uh, the purple indicating in distribution and the gray indicating OOD, uh, we can draw this threshold and separate them uh, much more reliably. And to evaluate um, and compare this uh, approach with um, softmax score, um, here we train a model on CIFAR-10 as in distribution and evaluate on SVHN as OOD. And so um, this plot on the left-hand side shows the uh, performance in terms of FPR uh, using softmax score. Um, so we measure the performance in terms of the fraction of OOD that is misclassified as in distribution uh, when we set the threshold so that a 95% of in distribution is above the threshold. Um, so lower is better. And here we see the FPR is around 48.87. Um, and uh, in contrast, using energy score can substantially reduce the um, FPR um, to 35%-ish. And we tested um, thoroughly on more uh, OOD data sets and consistently observe uh, a significant improvement here. Um, so again, this is model trained on Cypher 10 um, and the X axis um, um, highlights different OOD data sets. Um, and the blue is uh, when we use softmax score and uh, green is when we use energy score. Um, and uh, this paper has led to a series of uh, follow-up papers as well. Um, for the time being, I uh, won't go into the details, but I just wanted to um, show some of the high-level connection and the uh, summary. Um, for example, uh, we provided uh, provable guarantees of energy score um, in the first paper listed here uh, by payment. And we also showed that um, energy can be extended to other learning tasks um, beyond multi-class classification, such as multi-label classification, when each image can have uh, multiple ground truth labels. And there are uh, other um, follow-up works um, which showed, for example, using uh, rectified activation and sparsification can further improve the performance of um, energy score. Um, so if you're interested, um, feel free to um, check the works out. Um, for the time being, uh, let's continue. Um, so going beyond the test time OOD um, scoring function, I also want to briefly talk about the uh, learning objective design from a training time perspective. Um, in my view, I don't think we can fundamentally address this problem without um, rethinking how machine learning models are trained. And to explain what I mean, let's revisit uh, this example. Uh, this is a model trained using uh, ERM on the in-distribution data only. Um, so the decision boundary, as we saw earlier, um, is good for classification, but insufficient for OOD detection purposes. And so we need some training time regularization um, to explicitly account for the um, uncertainty um, outside the in-distribution data. And so the ideal decision boundary should be something more like the right-hand side that's much more conservative, right, surrounding our in-distribution data. And so the question really is, how do we go from the left to the right side? 
And to do so, um, we advocate for this uh, do objectives and learning, um, which is a combination of the standard cross entropy loss, um, which tries to classify the ID data. And additionally, we have this uncertainty regularization term, um, L energy, that tries to separate ID versus OOD data. And so the the right hand side is um, so this the second term is the new thing here. So now let's zoom into this regularization term L energy. Here's how it works. Um, for now, let's assume we have um, access to some um, auxiliary outlier uh, training data, uh, which I'll you know which I'll talk about how we relax this assumption in a second. Um, and so once you have that. Uh, our key idea is to explicitly push the energy score um, to be on on two sides, um, basically thresholded at zero. This middle dash line is when the energy is um, zero, and we try to push the energy scores to be on you know the the two sides of it for ID versus OOD. And this objective has some uh, nice mathematical interpretation too. Um, essentially, we're performing a level set estimation um, based on this measurement of um, energy score, which is uh, related to the log likelihood. And this uh, optimization is also much um, simpler and easier to optimize than directly estimating the log likelihood, which can be uh, often intractable. And so the result of the training is more separable distributions uh, measured by um, energy score, as you see on the right hand side, uh, where the FPR can be further reduced um, significantly. So this framework also opens up some interesting um, uh, research opportunities uh, and open questions. Um, for example, um, I have, you know, previously mentioned that um, the framework may assume that we have access to some auxiliary outlier data, but where do we even get this data from, right? Um, and one, um, one idea um, is to think about, can we leverage, can we leverage this wild data that, uh, that we can naturally collect upon deploying a machine learning classifier uh, and it's in the wild. And so, at a high level, uh, this wild data can offer several advantages. Uh, for example, it uh, better match this true test time um, distribution than using data collected um, offline, such as web crowd images. Um, and secondly, this um, approach doesn't require manual data collection and um, it can be available. You can get a lot of data in, uh, in abundance. However, uh, the challenge here is that, you know, the, the wild data is not pure, right? It's actually a mixture of both uh, in distribution and, and OOD. And uh, the interesting research qu question here is how do we um, get around this issue? And so um, if you're interested, um, please check out, um, for example, our ISML papers um, that's coming out this year uh, for methodologies of working around this and some theoretical guarantees. And another related um, research question is, um, how do we um, leverage this outlier data in some sample efficient manner? This is particularly useful when we're dealing with um, a, a very large sample space of outlier data. And so we put forward this notion of um, outlier mining, which aims to identify those most informative um, outlier training data points uh, that's sufficiently close to the decision boundary between ID versus OOD, as you see in this um, figure down below. And uh, lastly, what if we don't have um, any auxiliary outlier data at all, or when you know it's it's not feasible or possible to collect any? Um, what can we do? Is there something still you know smart we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, we can achieve um, just by working with in distribution data itself? 
And lastly, I just wanted to briefly um, touch on this uh, connection to the real world. Um, and when we're deploying uh, these, uh, considering this out of distribution detection methods for the real world, um, there are a couple important considerations. Um, the first is um, scalability. Um, for example, uh, a lot of these uh, approaches have been commonly benchmarked on uh, simple data sets such as um, Cypher, which has relatively lower resolution and fewer classes. But in the real world, we're going to be dealing with much higher resolution images with um, a lot more classes. And so how do we scale up OOD detection uh, methods um, to this large scale setting is a very important uh, problem to work on. Um, and the second is this um, localization ability, um, which, I, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, we need finer grained notion of um, OOD um, at this object level uh, beyond uh, the image level. For example, in this image, all we wanted to uh, highlight is uh, this helicopter as unknown, whereas the pedestrian and cars and all the other objects being uh, still normal in distribution objects. Um, and efficiency is another important consideration which could uh, matter in safety critical scenarios where latency matters. Um, for example, in case of self-driving car, uh, being able to detect um, OOD in, um, in computationally efficient manner um, can potentially uh, you know, caution the driver um, uh, far in advance, right? And so we need some efficient uh, methods for uh, detecting um, OOD um, with high accuracy as well. Um, so I would like to um, stop here and uh, thank you for uh, listening and uh, let me know if you have any question about the talk. Um, this is my uh, email in case you wanted to uh, reach out and I'd be happy to um, answer your questions.